The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the November 2nd Brown Bag on Collaboration Continuum. The Research and Research Collaboration Continuum project reported out at our member summit just a few weeks ago. And this is phase two of the report out, and we're happy that you could join us. Uh, with us, we have Robert Maximi, Assistant Professor and Academic Director at the Fox School of Business at Temple University. And we also have Natalie Schock, who is currently Director of Knowledge Management in the R&D Division of the Kellogg Company. Rob will be leading us through this presentation. So I just want to give you a little bit of background about Rob. He's responsible for managing and developing entrepreneurship and innovation-focused educational programs for the Fox School of Business. He promotes these programs both inside and outside the university, advises entrepreneurship students, and teaches courses in the IE's programs. His role as academic director also involves facilitating high-impact research collaborations between Temple University faculty and outside corporate and government partners. Rob's research focus is in the areas of knowledge exchange, creativity, innovation, and organizational learning. And before we get started, before I turn it over to Rob, um, I just want to do a few um, tips for the attendees on the call. Um, we have you all muted right now, and if you have a question, please raise your hand. You can also use the chat box to ask a question. We'll be monitoring those throughout the call. Um, there will be um, breaks within the presentation where we will open the floor for questions. Again, please raise your hand. And the slides will be posted on the IRI website after um, so this afternoon. So if um, we go through some of these pretty quickly, you can access them later. So welcome, everyone. And Rob, I'm going to turn it over to you now. All right. Thank you very much, Michelle. Uh, that was quite, quite a mouthful. <laughs> Thank you for uh, the intro. Um, you know, we, we ran this collaboration continuum project for the past few years, uh, Natalie, uh, Shock, Leonard Husky, and myself, and it was really a, a great project. And we reported out some of the results in the last meeting, and we just wanted to give a little more detail on, on some of the other parts of our study and some of the other what we think are interesting information. So, um, oh. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so basically, we had we had findings in three main areas, and uh, at the report out um, at the last meeting, we really talked okay. about the philosophical shifts. And in this kind of call, we're going to really okay. focus on listen, said, some of the empirical I'm, parts of this model. I'm out the I think Len, Len Husky is trying to log in. <laughs> so you know, again, we, we sort of covered this a little bit at the member summit, but just as a reminder, we started with this big research question: what's the business value of enterprise 2.0 software? Uh, and we wound up digging in and realizing we had to ask a number of other questions. Um, as we dug deeper, we started to really focus on the types of collaboration that drove different kinds of organizational outcomes, based on exchange knowledge networks and collaboration that existed, and how E2O was sort of affecting this or interacting with this. The uh, empirical results that we have today that I'm going to present today are primarily about the effects of culture and climate on uh, collaboration. Okay. And collaboration yeah, here you, you broadly means um, proactive searching and sharing, as well as exchange okay. across boundaries, and as okay. well as the exchange of passive yeah. and complex or novel yeah. knowledge. So, just a little bit about the research design. We did we did a, a pretty large survey with uh, more, you know 1,200 or so respondents, and the basic research model we had was we had this primary survey, which was designed to the measure climate motives. Departmental level social networks, um, also exchange role frequency and that kind of thing. And one of the main uh, sort of innovations in the way that we measured um, knowledge exchange here was we looked at four types of roles basically in knowledge exchange. So we looked at instances when people went out looking for knowledge, instances when other people came to them looking for knowledge, but then also correspondingly when people went and proactively offered or shared knowledge with other people, and then you know again on the other side of that coin when people were the reactive recipients of those types of exchanges. And we described these with these four names, searcher, transfer, share, and adopter, as a way to kind of conceptualize and differentiate these four roles, 
that really describe the, the, the majority of the roles that people play in, in typical knowledge exchanges in organizations. We kind of further looked at this and said, you know, there's these pull types of exchanges, right, where a recipient is pulling knowledge to them. But conversely, there's a push form of exchange where sources are pushing knowledge out to recipients. And ultimately, um, a good knowledge sharing, good organizational learning culture should enable both of these types of, of knowledge transfers to happen pretty effectively. And so these are the kinds of knowledge transfers we're really focused on. Our follow-on, the, the second survey that we had was an optional um, follow-on survey. What we did is randomly select one of those types of exchanges above, and we asked people basically more details about that type, the most recent um, one of those kinds of exchanges they had been involved in. So we were able to dig out a lot deeper and understand a lot of information about what people did when they were searchers, how they reacted if they were transfers, et cetera. And so then we measured characteristics of the exchange, the relationship, the knowledge that was transferred, and all those various types of knowledge. So again, as I mentioned, we had 1,293 um, responses. We surveyed about 2,700 people, so we had a 47% response rate, which was quite high. Participating companies were from various industries, a couple of chemical companies, consumer products companies, telecom. But again, this is some really fundamental knowledge exchange stuff. So I think it's it's really generalizable, regardless of which uh, or regardless, sorry, of which um, industry you're in. So I have some demographic information. This part I'm going to go through really quickly because it's just baseline information, and I, it might not be. Right, I hope it's legible or readable for you guys. But um, basically, this is just showing the kind of these were typical IRI companies. So um, highly educated a lot of research and development folks, a lot of the analysis I did also with just research and development people involved because, you know, as you can see there, Company 4, for example, had a much larger customer service population, whereas Company 2 had only exclusively R&D in the division that we surveyed. Um, long time in the industry, older employees, again, typical IRI companies. Uh, you know, many people with 30 plus years of, of employment. Um, Years of job, a little less <clears throat> years of the job, less, less tenure and job, but a lot of tenure at the companies. Again, I think pretty typical for IRI companies. So one of the things that this part, this first primary survey was really designed to dig deeper into was the climate and motivation, the complex set of motivations that encourage sort of positive, uh, high value knowledge exchanges in organizations. And you know, ultimately culture and climate as well as motivations can, can be motivating or demotivating. It can have a negative effect or a positive effect on knowledge exchange. Um, so just to, for example, we measured collaborative climate versus judgmental climate, and these actually were, we let them emerge based on the analysis. So we measure a number of items that we thought would be relevant, and we use factor analysis to see what kind of emerged out of that. But just for example, some of the items that would measure collaborative climate, upper management believes knowledge sharing is a key responsibility, radical new ideas are appreciated, people consider a variety of perspectives. And then conversely, a judgmental climate would be you know, things like people are very critical when others make mistakes. They harshly judge those that show they don't know something. And these are two very different climates that can be created in a department or even in a whole division or organization. In researching what exists out there about the motivational influences on knowledge sharing, I looked really quite broadly at creativity literatures, knowledge sharing literature, and everything. And what these literatures typically focused on one or two trade-offs. And I kind of put these trade-offs into this framework. And so I hope this is not too complex. but um, Basically, people typically are one of the one of the main research streams looked at how people are worried about losing some of their unique value when they share knowledge. But conversely, they do this because by sharing knowledge, they strengthen relationships with others, or they encourage future reciprocity with those people when they when they share that knowledge. Right. So that's one example of a trade-off. Another example of positive: they may gain recognition as an expert when they share this valid knowledge or you know high-impact creative ideas. Another trade-off is that basically when we share kind of these crazy ideas, we may risk pushing our colleagues away, which either challenge the status quo or we say things that are sort of quote unquote unacceptable in the current context. Um, on the other hand, we may be risking another you know sort of trade-off is we are risking losing um, sorry, I changed my thing here. Maybe lose, losing a little bit of our status if the knowledge that we present proves to be a little bit inaccurate or it's not exactly correct, et cetera. And this is typically called evaluation apprehension. Um, however, the reason that we still do share knowledge is because we may gain access then to higher status groups, or we may become more central in our existing groups if our ideas prove useful. So this framework sort of, of looking at knowledge capital, you know, human capital is typically called status, and social capital and social status, this is sort of a good framework to think about these trade-offs that describe a lot of the motivations that happen in this space. 
And the last motivation here is that basically, and this is actually not very, very well studied, but it's recognized, is that some people recognize that when they share knowledge and collaborate, they actually learn and develop new knowledge, right? So that's sort of the contrary perspective to a, pers you know, a person that might believe they're losing knowledge when they share it. So collectively, we measure this set of climate and motivations. This is actually one of the most comprehensive sets of motivators and demotivators that I've seen in any studies. And so we measured collaborative culture, <clears throat> um, judgmental culture on the negative side, we measured intrinsic motivation, identification motivation, positive social motives. Um, that's, for example, seeking acceptance or desire for acceptance. Extrinsic motivation, sort of being rewarded, paid for things. Um, negative social motives is a desire to avoid rejection. And so I think you saw those parallels in the, past, in the previous slide. Fear of loss of unique value. Organization being in flux of the control and uncertainty about the future. And lastly, I throw extrinsic motivation on the negative demotivator side, too, because the research is mixed as far as how extrinsic motivation affects knowledge sharing. In some literature, it's assumed that it's sort of a, a sign of what the organization values. In other literature, it's basically a, uh, it, it trumps sort of intrinsic motivation and undermine other forms of motivation. So we had basically a number of items that measured all these, these types of characteristics. And I'm just going to present some of the results on this, but I wanted to lay some of the, the groundwork. So just to even get like, why does this matter? Um, that's you know sort of ultimately what we come down to here. So this, this this results here are actually based on structural equation modeling. So there's a big complex path model that goes behind this. But I wanted to show sort of the takeaway, so I think that's more of what you know people really care about. Um, just for example, a one point increase in intrinsic motivation, increased knowledge searching frequency by 134 um, percent. Correspondingly, and possibly more importantly, a one point increase in intrinsic motivation actually increased knowledge sharing by 224%, so more than doubled um, knowledge sharing frequency. So the frequency with which people would proactively go out and share knowledge with other people in their organization. Um, organization identification was revealed as a very important factor, as was collaborative culture. And then the negative social motives is a really important demotivator for particularly, it wasn't uh, nearly as relevant on, um, it wasn't as relevant on the, uh, on the knowledge searching side, the sort of pull side. But it was a very important demotivator for the knowledge sharing. So it, it, it reduced the frequency with which people would share knowledge proactively if they thought that there was a fear that they might lose status and things like that based on the type of knowledge that they, they shared. Um, just one other thing to emphasize, there, are, there were some organizational differences here. And so those results I just showed were collectively across the four companies. But um, for example, company four, there was a little bit different survey model. In company four, we surveyed globally. And, it, and it's interesting because in this case, organization identification became a little less significant. Um, it became insignificant, actually, on the knowledge searching side, a little less significant on the knowledge sharing side. Um, on the other side, actually, positive social motives became really, really important in, in, in company four. Um, so that is basically people's desire for acceptance and getting more acceptance, basically, as they shared knowledge. This was a really important factor that affected how much they sought new knowledge across the organization. And there's various explanations for that, but it may be that people are seeking more validation, more confirmation that you know that their knowledge they're they're going forward with is appropriate and what have you. Again, in an international context, there's maybe a number of factors that might be at play. So these are some of the examples of the impact of this. One of the uh, things that kind of showed. Sure, go ahead. Sorry. Uh, one clarifying question came through. Um, please clarify what plus one point means. Sure. So uh, sorry, this was a, a seven point scale. And so um, I'm actually going to show some, some more demogra some data. You'll actually see the range. But it was a seven-point scale, so shifting from, let's say, a five to a six um, on intrinsic motivation. And this is basically the degree to which people agreed with the statements in intrinsic motivation, for example, I enjoy solving complex problems. Um, in social motives, um, I build closer relationships with others in the organization when I share my knowledge, for example. So again, we did a number of tests, basically, looking for um, significant differences across different pools of folks in our study. And one of the more interesting things is that for one of the companies, we actually had employee performance data. So we had data on their high performers, mid performers, and low performing employees. And so we, this is kind of an important benchmark for us to look at to figure out sort of what's relevant or what's important. And what are the high performer employees? How do they behave? Or how do they see the world differently than the sort of low performing employees? So we found some interesting stuff that, you know, for example, the high-performance employees had the highest intrinsic motivation. They had the highest rating of positive social motives. So sort of, again, a belief that when they share knowledge, they build closer ties with people. They, 
they, re they have some social return on sharing knowledge, basically. Um, they also had the lowest fear of loss of unique value when they shared knowledge, and they had the lowest perception of judgmental culture. Now, you know, kind of have to take this with a grain of salt because we can't really assess causality here. You know, the mid-performance employees had the highest rating of judgmental culture, and, you know, this is their last performance review. So it may be that they receive their performance review and that affects their perception. Um, I think that, that might be true for things like judgmental culture. Things like intrinsic motivation are pretty um, insulated from these kind of external influences, but something just to take, a, take into account or consider. Organizations that participate in the study actually got a lot of interesting information that's less anonymized. I mean, you guys are seeing anonymous data here, but they saw basically benchmarking data. Um, company three and four tended to have a more positive sort of collaborative culture. Um, company two had a, a much more judgmental culture, for example. So it's, it's just kind of interesting um, demo, you know, differences across the companies that we saw. We also, and I don't know if everybody's familiar with looking at um, these kind of uh, these kind of bar charts, but basically that graph that you're looking at, the, the dark line in the middle represents the, the median point. The yellow bar represents um, the 50 percentile, basically uh, one standard deviation above, one to below of data, and then the whiskers represent another 25 percent up and down. So basically, your outliers are the little dots that are left over, but that represents the vast majority of the data. So this kind of graph represents both the median um, or the mean and also the range, right? So it, it represents basically how high something is, but also how broad the range is. It helps kind of, it's a little complex to look at, but it represents a lot of data in a, in, in a single graph. So the companies that participated, we actually looked at these differences across their departments within the companies and across the companies. And, you know, so this is sorted out, so on the left side are the, sort of the best climate. And again, I don't, I don't necessarily want you, I mean, you shouldn't necessarily, or you can't really read that, it doesn't mean anything on the bottom, but the companies that participated actually got non-anonymized versions of this. And what I wanted to emphasize here, there was significant varies, variation intra-organizationally. So there was no one organization that all their departments had the best climate. There was typically always some, some departments that had really excellent climate, really good motivational systems in place that people were really motivated in a positive way to facilitate knowledge sharing. And there were always some other, other parts of the organization, other departments that really could benefit with, from some improvement. And so the companies that we reported back to basically were able to use this data to look at parts of their organization that had the best climate, learn some best practices, figure out how those sort of motivational uh, you know, models were put in place and how, how the employees were motivated in those different departments. So that was collaborative culture. We saw, again, you know, big differences across judgmental culture. Also intrinsic motivation, for example. You know, some departments just had employees that were much more intrinsically motivated. That's actually a little outside of the control of the organization in general, but it helps us understand what types of employees, you know, do exhibit this sort of desire to solve complex problems. Uh, and lastly, fear of loss of unique value. This is actually one of the most important ones because this is something that's potentially actionable or, or organizations can really improve this re readily. There's this last section, this is the first section, I'll have a break for questions in one second, but basically the last thing that we found that was kind of an interesting story that kind of emerged was the sort of trough of disillusionment. So basically, we, we, again, I said, I looked at all these uh, numbers across a number of different categories of employees, and one of the things we found is that there's a really systematic um, set of bad climate and bad motivators for people with tenure between 8 and 15 years. So basically, these are the people that perceive the collaborative culture to be the lowest, judgmental culture to be the highest, they have the highest level of social uh, negative motives, uh, sorry, negative social motives, highest fear of loss of unique value, and the most anxiety about the future. So that's all in that kind of group in the middle there. And that's really the core of, you know, many of, of your organizations. And so I think it's an important um, thing to acknowledge that they basically have a lot of things that are encouraging them not to share knowledge or not to share creative ideas. And I don't know the answer to necessarily why that is, but it's just an interesting thing that, that emerged. So that's sort of the first, uh, you know, more or less two half or so of the of the presentations. I want to take a break for questions or or discussion. Again, raise your hand if you have a question, or feel free to uh, chat, and we'll unmute you if you have a question. I have a question, uh, Rob. How do you measure intrinsic motivation? Sure. Uh, 
that's a great question. I'll answer the question as far as how we measured it, but there's also a, there's some, some valid follow-on stuff. So in this case, what we measured, because we were looking at knowledge exchange, um, I actually, we measured intrinsic motivation as a love of solving problems. There's actually a number of different types of intrinsic motivation that are at play when you deal with knowledge sharing. So a lot of past studies, to be honest with you, have measured intrinsic motivation and knowledge exchange as a love of helping other people. Um, but because we were measuring social motives separately from intrinsic motivation, there was a risk of overlap. If we use helping other people, you know, a love of helping other people, and then a separate me set of measures in the social motive area that says, you know, I get a lot of, you know, social, I build new social connections, or I build relationships, I do all these things when I share knowledge, there was a risk that those two things would overlap. And so we used a measure actually that's called uh, need for cognition, which is a, another form of intrinsic motivation, which is basically people's love of, of solving problems or engaging in sort of intellectual activity, if you will. But the sort of uh, implicit belief that intrinsic motivation is unidimensional, I think is really fatally flawed. There's a lot of types of things that people really enjoy doing, and those can encourage them to share knowledge in, in very different ways, actually, potentially. There's another question. Can such a large standard development allow such conclusions on the trough of disillusionment? Was that such so, so a large standard deviation, or I'm sorry, I didn't know there. Yeah, standard sorry. deviation. Um, you know, these, these are only highlighted if they're statistically significant. Um, you're right, though, that there's, there, there's, these are pretty small effects, right? So you look at the difference between 4.7 and 4.5. I mean, that's statistically significant. We have a big sample, right, or a relatively big sample. Um, it, it's, it's a valid issue to, you know, sort of take this as you will, decide how you want to examine it. But I would say that these are very emergent phenomena. So these are, you know, the knowledge exchange that we engage in are dozens, you know, hundreds of times, basically a week or whatever. If some things change things, even a hundredth or, you know, or one percent, if it changes the way I behave, just a, a very fraction of, of my behavior is affected by that. Across, the, you know, millions of interactions and, and exchanges, it can have really radical effects. So I think, you know, statistical significance, obviously, you know, that's, it's, for what it's worth, that's what it is. But I do think that because these are such emergent phenomena, they're so fundamental to the way people share knowledge, and we do find, I mean, I do find effects of this, I'm going to talk, I'll show in a second, I do find effects of some of these things on the types of knowledge exchanged, um, the tendency to interact with higher status experts, a lot of other things that are sort of more concrete, I guess. But, um, I, you know, I think it's, it's a fair point to say, you know, how, how much does this mean? But I think this is emergent, it's quite, quite substantial. And, and also because it's, across several different measures here all kind of come together um, to highlight this sort of negative sort of atmosphere or, or mood or whatever. So Michelle, should I go forward a little bit then? I, we can come back to any questions about the first section also if I go forward a little bit more. Oh, okay. So the second, now, now I'm going to talk about the second part of the survey. So that was sort of a little bit of the findings that we had from the first primary part of the survey where we measured culture and climate and, and we had information about individuals uh, in organizations. But now I'm going to look at the knowledge exchange portion of the study. And so I have just a couple of slides to set this up. And you know, so ultimately when you, you deal with knowledge exchanges in an organization, in order for a knowledge exchange to happen successfully, um, first of all, you need to find the right person to interact with. And this is a big challenge, potentially, especially in large organizations like your organizations. Um, secondly, both of the parties, the source and the recipient, have to both be motivated enough to engage in the effort required to transfer knowledge. You know, it's not that simple, actually, to, to transfer knowledge. And lastly, both parties have to understand one another. So the source has to understand the challenge that the recipient is facing, and the recipient has to understand the sort of solutions and answers provided by the source, or knowledge provided by the source. If either one of them don't understand the other, then that knowledge exchange is not going to happen very, very effectively. Um, so there's another kind of perspective that can help us understand this, and this is the um, research on transactive memory systems. And so the, the kind of simple definition is these are shared systems that people in relationships develop for encoding, storing, and retrieving information in organizations, typically. Um, Wegner actually, back in 95, came with this computer storage metaphor. And he basically used this, this sort of efficiency argument for how computers store information and argued that that's how organizations should store information. This has been adapted a little bit since then, but it still carries a lot of weight. So ultimately, one thing that has to happen is that 
you have to constantly be updating the system. So people have to be learning who knows what throughout the organization or throughout the group that they're interacting with. The second thing is they have to, when new pieces of information come into the system, they have to be transferred and moved to the parts of the system that can store that information most effectively and efficiently. So basically, if you learn something new, it has to be transferred over to the people that can leverage it most effectively in the organization or have the roles that are they're responsible for that type of knowledge. Lastly, the retrieval coordination suggests that there has to be a plan in place to find knowledge based on who knows what. Right? So typically, transactive memory, people think of, of quite simple, this part of it, and they think basically it's just who knows what. But it actually involves all three of these things, and, and it's critical that all three are in place. Sort of collectively, this emphasizes the importance of reducing barriers and expanding reach. Right? You can only know where knowledge exists throughout the organization if you have a good awareness of people outside of your local environment, your local department, division, work group, et cetera. Um, so expanding reach, breaking barriers, that's sort of one part that this emphasizes. The other thing is that this sort of dual information allocation retrieval coordination element suggests the importance of this push and pull that I highlighted in the beginning, right? So it, import, it suggests it's important for us to, when we learn new knowledge, to push it out to the people that might need it or might be the right place for it to be leveraged in the organization. And correspondingly, we have to know where to pull knowledge from when we need certain types of knowledge, right? And so this kind of push and pull perspective that I laid out in the beginning, that's actually a little bit groundbreaking, or it's, it's quite new, actually, um, in the research on knowledge exchange. So I think this is something sort of thought leading that we're trying to do here with this project. So the exchange survey, again, you know, I'm not going through all this data, but we had um, 543 usable respondents. Um, that's about 20% response rate, which is not bad since it's an optional follow-up survey. Um, we had 722 usable interactions. And in company two and three, we actually uh, measure two interactions per person. And we only use the, the, the first one of those interactions actually for most of the analyses here, but in the future we're going to do some multi-level models where we can look at, at both of those interactions and, and get some really interesting within subject effects. Um, again, to gather this data, we asked respondents to recall a specific recent knowledge exchange interaction of a certain type. And this model is designed to really ground them in reality. In fact, they put the initials or a nickname for that person in, and then throughout the survey we say, you know, the last time you interacted with Joe, you know, how did he act in such and such a way? Um, and so it really is supposed to ground them in really remembering that interaction and being more accurate in their recollections. So again, some of the descriptives, I mean, the, the majority of the interactions were, um, you know, less than two hours. There were some kind of outliers out there. I actually dropped off the sort of really long interactions that people either didn't understand the question or there was something uh, strange about their response. So, but most of them were less than two hours. Most of them were less than, than a week previous. Um, there were some that went out for a couple of weeks previous. Now, it depended, um, for example, people actually had a little recall bias. They didn't recall instances where other people offered them knowledge as readily. Um, and so basically, that was an example where people would tend to recall. They'd go back further to remember the last time that somebody offered them knowledge. And so we try to control for that by controlling for these, this interaction lag. Um, most of the time, these interactions were either totally informal or somewhat informal. Very few of the interactions were actually in a very formalized context, like a weekly meeting with your boss. Most of them were in person, some of them were by phone, some of them were by email, a few by instant messaging, nothing, not, not really much on video conferencing or knowledge management systems. Most of the time in one-on-one -on -one interactions, a uh, fair amount of time in small groups, so very rarely in large groups. Um, we also measured stage gate information here. I'm actually not going to present any results on that, but I have done some analysis on that. And we measured basically if it was in the stage gate process or if that was not applicable. So I'm just going to highlight a number of knowledge exchange barriers that did come up um, in, as we analyze the data that are kind of salient. And again, uh, you know, assuming that it's important for us to know people and interact with people across the organization um, from the transactive memory stuff I just talked about, et cetera, it's really important that people sort of interact beyond their close boundaries. Uh, the pe they interact with people with diverse perspectives and things like that. So one thing is people tend to interact with people that are the same age as them. So that's kind of in that picture depicted. People tend to interact with people that are the same rank as them or a slightly higher rank. They also tend to interact with people that have relatively similar levels of expertise as they do. Um, although in that case, there's more of a tendency towards people with greater specialized expertise to the problem at hand. That's that right graph. We also find that people tend to interact with strong ties. And strong ties are basically people you frequently interact with as well as people you feel a close relationship with. Um, however, the relationships are not exceptionally long, actually. Many of the people or most of the people interact with they've known for less than five years. And so there are certainly some, some long relationships in here, but a lot of interactions with close ties that people haven't known for very long, but that they interact with frequently now. We also found some examples 
Um, we, we had some department level social network data in here. So this is a social network analysis of one of the actual companies involved. We found obvious geographic barriers. This is the only company that we did global a global survey for. We found that Asia and Europe really rarely interacted. In fact, North America served as a bit of a bridge. Um, you know, we saw a number of different factors here, like their Skunk Works group off on the side there, not Lockheed Martin, though, I'm just using that as, a, as an example. We also found, um, you know, product line breaks. This is a different organization, but in this case, these are two divisions of this organization that make largely the same product just for different markets. And actually, they very, very rarely interact, and research serves as a bridge between them. So again, these are you know very obvious depictions. That this data, this social network data, is based on people. One of the questions that we asked was, how frequently do you interact with? And then we give a list of say 10, 15, or 20 sort of departments or divisions throughout the organization. And so that data actually aggregated up. We can you know we uh, merge that together, and you, you do a bunch of analysis to it with social network analysis, and you build these ties across the divisions. So this is the real takeaway slide, I think. You know, so the other stuff was set up. There, there's a lot of barriers in organizations. We found evidence of them. We kind of know that they exist, but it sort of quantifies them. But what we found is, um, again, this is all based on structural equation modeling behind the scenes, but what we found is the importance of relationships affecting the usefulness of knowledge exchanges. And there's a couple of important things here. First of all, we found that interacting with a higher rank source is actually less useful, and quite statistically significantly less useful. So interacting with managers or top management turns out to be less useful. And there's a reason for this. One is that those people tend to transfer less complex knowledge. And it turns out the knowledge that's made up of more pieces and parts, knowledge that's more, uh, more complex, basically, is, is more useful to people. Um, also, the higher status individuals have lower effort and engagement. They, they try harder during an exchange, which we might expect. A second thing here that kind of reveals itself, is, which is kind of interesting, is that strong ties are only marginally important in predicting the usefulness of a knowledge exchange. However, the specialized expertise of a source is much more useful. It's four, the coefficient is four times as large. The effect is roughly four times as large. Um, so interacting with specialized experts is much more important than interacting with strong ties. Now, I draw this contrast because really, if we don't know who knows what in an organization, we tend to then rely on the people we know well. And so in fact, I'll, I'll highlight this in a second, sort of the use of enterprise 2.0 systems, social networking systems, facilitate the connection with actual experts and reduce the reliance on strong ties. So there's a few different reasons this happens. One, specialized experts tend to transfer more complex knowledge, which again is, is related to usefulness. They also tend to transfer more novel knowledge, right? And non-redundant novel knowledge, really important uh, thing to transfer in organizations. They also have relatively good level of effort and engagement. Uh, strong ties has a slightly uh, higher uh, coefficient, slightly more impact actually. So they're a little bit more engaged. However, specialized experts were not less engaged. They were still positively engaged in, in the exchange. The reason I highlight again this contrast is that one of the risks when you go outside of your strong ties is that people may not be engaged to sort of put the effort in that's necessary to transfer knowledge. It's actually the kind of impact of specialized experts probably even a little bit underappreciated because specialized experts transfer, as I said, novel knowledge. And novel knowledge is actually not positively related with usefulness. Now that's, that's a sort of, we, we would assume that not new knowledge would actually be relatively useful to people. But it's also hard for people to understand. It takes them in different directions. So I think there's an added component, there's an added positive outcome of novelty that's actually not quite captured here because recipients don't really realize the true sort of impact, the true importance of them hearing something really new. Um, so there might be a sort of underappreciation even of the importance of specialized expertise because of this. So just as a summary slide, and then we have another spot here for questions. But you know, an optimized transactive memory system people interact with appropriate, the best sources for a type of knowledge needed, right? And so enterprise 2.0 systems, social networking systems, et cetera, these really enable exchanges with the appropriate specialized expert, no matter where they are in the organization. So they break down barriers, and they reduce this reliance on rank, sort of interacting with your manager, as well as past relationships, strong ties, in order to identify the real source you want to interact with. You know, so that avoids sort of useless or even worse, negatively useful exchanges with the wrong people in the organization. So I think this is a sort of selling point for organizations to consider the importance of leveraging social networking systems to really start to connect people from across the organization. Um, I mean, a lot of subjects here to, that kind of emerge to say the most useful interactions are not when I interact with my close ties, they're when I interact with specialized experts. And this kind of graph just shows that those two things are not really correlated. In fact, there's a, there's a marginally significant negative correlation and basically that's because people either interact with a greater, higher expertise source 
or they interact with a strong tie to some extent. So another spot for questions. Sorry if I talk a little quickly. I, I tend to get, get kind of passionate about talking about this stuff. <laughs> Michelle, any questions? Uh, not yet. No one has their hands raised. Um, maybe just wait a, a little bit, another sure. few seconds to see if anyone can key in a question. Just want to make sure also I didn't lose the connection or something. <laughs> no, we still got you. I am in New Jersey, so you can't trust the infrastructure these days. Okay, I'm showing no questions at this time, Rob. Okay. So the last little area that I wanted to talk about here, um, you know, so I'm actually going to start with a story. And, and this is actually some, this area, this stuff right here um, is, is pretty groundbreaking. This is a, a totally new area. There has not been any research done on this. So I think there's some thought-leading possibility here, but it's also a little bit early stage. So. One of the things I measured, and it looks like I might have enough time, depending on how many questions there are, to get into this, but one of the things we measured in the study was the point at which people were in the problem-solving process when they engaged with a source to try to receive new knowledge. So basically, when I was in, interacting with somebody, was I looking for help formulating the problem, or was I looking for a solution to a well-formed problem? And that was something we looked at. And then we actually looked at what knowledge, type of knowledge was actually provided by the source. Did they provide? sort of what I was looking for, or did they provide something different? Um, and this is sort of Rob, important. Can I interrupt you and back up just for a second? Sure, go ahead. Um, we, have a, we have a question. Um, the most surprising part to me was that people tend to interact with people their own age. Do you have insights as to why this is and how to change that behavior? Hmm, interesting. I, you know, now that was a that's a t test comparison. That's a mean value comparison. I don't recall if, for example, if I controlled for tenure, if that relationship would still hold, for example, um, or if I controlled for formal hier you know hierarchical rank, if that would still hold. Um, but so I, you know I think there there is certainly a tendency to interact with people that are the same rank, the same tenure, more or less the same age as you, and that sort of collectively, if we, if you will, there's sort of a tendency to do that. Um, but I, you know, I don't, I don't know. I mean, certainly creating communities, I mean, there's a lot of techniques that could resolve this, right? Creating communities that are not based on this, and et cetera. But, um, you know, really facilitating those, those exchanges with diverse other people, people with different perspectives. I mean, we all tend to hang out with people that are like us, right? That's just the tendency that we have. And, and we tend to talk to people that are like us. So I think that's probably a, 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 what we're seeing there. Okay, thank you. Sure. And, you know, I think that, that is certainly one form of diversity. And, and just encouraging any form of diversity, you know, boundary spanning is effectively about an, an encouraging diversity, right? It's just critical to creating novel, new combinations of knowledge. So I think, you know, all of those barriers have, have an impact. And sort of collectively, it, you know, the intention is just, I mean, I think what we show is that basically people tend to interact with people that are closer to them in, in various ways. Um, so just to, so so basically, this problem solving process that we are measuring, um, this is something that you know in in creativity research, the importance of problem formulation, for example, is huge. We actually just heard, I think, in the report out, uh, one of the the talks that sort of discussed the sort of problem formulation and and horizontal validation, vertical validation, and you know I think that that's very consistent with the research on the creative problem solving process. How important it is to spend time formulating your problems. So so what we basically found, this is the story here, and you probably read it by now since I'm talking away, but um, individuals are no more likely to seek out top experts, expert sources, for problem knowledge or solution knowledge or any type of knowledge. However, highly expert sources are much more likely to provide unsolicited problem reformulations during exchange. So I basically don't go to top experts when I'm formulating my problem. I go to them kind of whenever throughout the process. But when I do go to them and I'm asking for a solution, for example, they tend to say, oh, by the way, you're asking the wrong question. You should be thinking about this question differently. However, there's a barrier to this. Recipients find actually all knowledge provided by expert sources to be more useful except for unsolicited problem formulation. So nobody likes to get pushed backwards in the problem solving process. And the last little piece that kind of finishes the story is that this problem knowledge, I mean actually all problem knowledge is much more tacit than other forms of knowledge than solution knowledge. So this is really highlighting 
I think, an important barrier to the tra transfer of tacit knowledge from experts to other people in the organization. So basically, and, and I've heard sort of a couple of examples from organizations about this, but I'd love to hear more examples from you guys. But basically, a couple of organizations have described environments where you only go to the sort of the top experts when you have a well-formed thing, when you've spent a lot of time thinking about something, because you don't want to waste their time, right? However, what this creates is a problem is that you're never engaging the top experts to actually kind of co-create a problem, to explore an opportunity space. All you're doing is going to them when you have this really specific, like, should I do A or B? And it's like, oh, do B. But by the way, really, you should have considered C. And what's happening is that people never want to be pushed back in that process. And so consequently, experts' knowledge is not being utilized. It's not being leveraged in this kind of context. And this is actually quite actionable. I mean, if, in fact, the companies agree and this, this turns out, as we do some further research, if it turns out to be like a really a, a real barrier, and if, if you know, companies validate this qualitatively, et cetera, you know, it, it's quite easy to actually facilitate exchanges with top experts at earlier phases of the problem-solving process. Either train you know, employees in the problem-solving process, train them in creative problem-solving techniques, et cetera, or just have, you know, allow it, say it's okay to come to an expert with an ill-formed problem and help think through the things you need to research in order to attack that problem. So this, I think, is quite actionable. So I could actually, I mean, I, I could um, sort of jump right to questions. I have some, some frameworks for this, I mean, you know, for thinking about this. I mean, and you guys can look at it offline, but there's a, there's a whole framework for how the problem-solving process I consider it as a way to contextualize every knowledge exchange. Um, and so there's some information there. And here's some of the actual evidence that shows this. Um, there's a moderation effect, et cetera. But we could just you know, talk about questions, I think, for the last uh, you know, 10, 10 or 15 minutes. We could talk about any discussion. Um, and also, if anybody's interested in follow-up projects, we have a couple of plans here on the slide. And Natalie and Len, too, some of that stuff's new for you, so I welcome questions from you guys. <laughs> Okay, we have a hand raised. Um, Beth, I'm going to unmute you. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I have a question about the, uh, the action step and how you avoid a situation where the expert uh, kind of turns off the person who's asking that question. That is, there are some mentors that are better than others. Sure. So the only the last part I missed, I think, just that some mentors are better. Did you say? Or I'm sorry. Yeah, some mentors are better than others. Sure. You know. So again, um, I I think part of this has to be a cultural norm. Um, you know, the organization has to say, listen, you know, fellows or expert groups. You know, this is not just mentors, right? This is any higher expertise source. So it's basically if I know there's an expert in, you know, I don't know. Uh, you know, high-speed rotational equipment over in this group, and I have a you know engineering challenge where I need to you know know something about that, and I go to them and say, can you please tell me you know how to deal with X Y Z? Um, you know, and so the, the 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 problem is that if I went to them with this sort of ill, you know, I'm kind of noting some trend like this, and I'm wondering if we should you know how we should be thinking about this, and and maybe they wouldn't be engaged with that. So so you're right that some experts, you know, it takes more time to do this, right? It's a whole extra set of knowledge exchanges that they'd have to engage in. Some of them are not going to be maybe open to sort of collaboratively evolving through this. Um, I do think that mentorship is probably one way actually that would open the that would open this up actually that would that would maybe create more of this co-creation of opportunities or co-exploration of opportunities. Um, but I think that ultimately, in my opinion at least, and, and again this is a, still a pretty new area, but I, I think that the culture would have to be such that there would be times or spaces or something set aside to sort of facilitate that type of exchange, right? That type of open exploration with experts, potentially. There's another question. Um, how do you get young people to admit their need for help, even in defining the problem? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, I'm not sure how informed any of my answers would be, um, but I think, I, one thing is, I mean, there's a, there, there is a lot of research on creative problem-solving process that 
um, shows that people don't even understand that they have to spend time formulating a problem. So I think that a lot of times, um, in fact, even in the survey, it was difficult to get people to distinguish these two behaviors. Um, and I've heard at other IRI talks sort of this challenge of teaching people to discuss opportunities and explore opportunities. And I mean, one thing is to make people realize that there is a systematic process for exploring an opportunity, right, for exploring a problem, for you know, doing root cause analysis or, or, or really spending time exploring a problem in, in whatever aspect of their job, right? They may do it in their engineering challenge, but then in their business life, they just sort of don't, you know, may not do this. Um, you know, so I think one thing is to educate people about this sort of problem solving process. That's, that's one, one way to do so. But as far as admitting problems, um, I've actually heard more, the opposite problem we've heard in, the, in, our, in this study, a lot of examples that more senior people are not willing to admit ignorance, whereas junior people are quite willing to post a blog that says, I have no clue how to do X, can somebody help me? Um, but again, that's, we don't have too, not a very big sample size to, to discuss that. I, I don't, uh, other people might have better answers. I don't have any questions at this time. How about Lynn and Natalie, are they still on? Hold on. Still on? Yeah, hold on. Hey, Natalie, you're unmuted. Hi, yeah. Um, one uh, related to that question about newer people not knowing that they don't know things, I think one of the things that this has illuminated for me is this idea that if the only people I go to are the people I know, then I may not even know that I don't know. So I think that that's one of the reasons we're interested in exploring a little more this whole weak tie or new ties, and especially in the world of these new social media tools, which could actually allow these connections. And you know, probably more for younger people than for older people because they're more used to using these kinds of things and posting to a blog. Hey, I don't have any idea how to solve this. Can you help me? So, I mean, I think there's there's more in there that we could dig out. You notice I put you as a contact person there, Natalie. I, I did notice that, Rob. <laughs> That's because I'm very enthused about this. So if, if anybody's interested in this, we really would like to talk to you, you know, now or at the next midwinter meeting. Yeah, we're, we're basically, we're thinking about doing a follow-up project that would really be focused on weak ties in particular. So these would be people that you don't know very well, you don't interact with frequently, people in other parts of the organization, and looking at how they basically create new knowledge, how they help, how their interactions with them, exchanges with them create new knowledge and share different novel knowledge. And then hopefully how Enterprise 2.0 systems help us maintain our weak ties. So how do you stay in touch with the people in another part of the organization and keep track of what they're working on when you no longer work with them? And then also, how does it help you, enable you to contact somebody new? And what are some of the features that are critical? Like, so is it really important that you see that they worked on a project with somebody you know, so you have that sort of re referent tie? Or is it really important that they went to the same university as you or something like that? And, and look at some of these features that might enable new tie creation or weak tie maintenance in organizations. Well, and then to be able to demonstrate some of the things that Rob was talking about earlier about how new ideas come not from just talking to the same people that know the same stuff that you are, that you know, but to talk to people who know different things and the bringing together of that different information to create new ideas. Because yep. I think there's a lot of power in that and I think these new systems really give us a great opportunity to tap into that. We have a couple of questions that came in so either of you could answer. Um, what, what would you recommend as an effective social networking tool for use in IRI member companies? So, so we saw a lot of different examples of that. Um, you, you have so many options these days, and I think we saw best practices that people used all of them. Um, so I mean, we saw people use Jive, which is an outsourced software as a service type system in large organizations. Um, you know, use that system. A lot of people were using Microsoft. Um, you know, products, um, you know, Moss, you know, SharePoint, basically with the uh, the user, uh, the social networking components plugged in. Um, there's also the Lockheed Martin launched an open source toolkit, 
which um, you know, so that's a, a sort of relatively free, if you will, um, that companies could explore if they have the technical capabilities to sort of main, you know install and maintain, et cetera. And that is called Unity, I think. Is that correct? Yeah, that's um, right, Unity. But there's a lot of potential Yammer. You know, there's there's sort of companies decide to either go with sort of full bore social networking or kind of more of a Twitter type, you know, kind of interface. And you know, the Twitter, the Yammer interface or Twitter interface actually has a lower barrier to posting new things. So sometimes they find more rapid adoption there. But it really depends on on your challenges. Uh, a lot of people use community practice in various systems as a core part of their social networking system. And another question, what works best, push or pull? Is this dependent upon an age group? Hmm, interesting. It, it's a tough one. I mean, I think the, the um, in the data, I didn't show these results, but we, we find that basically um, source-initiated knowledge exchange push, when it's solicited, is the most useful ty type of knowledge. So basically, if people accurately recognize the knowledge you need and push it to you, best situation. Because um, it's very efficient, right? So, I mean, basically, otherwise, if every time I need to find new knowledge, I have to go and, you know, talk to 100 different people and find out who knows it and go one at a time, you know, through those people, it's very inefficient, right? If instead I can broadcast my needs and count on people then pro proactively come to me, you know, that's fantastic. Um, you know, of course, pull is the most common, you know, form of knowledge exchange. I mean, people, when they have a need, they got to, you know, it's immediate, they go out and they find that knowledge. Um, but the problem is, and this is sort of uh, implicit in some of the stuff that I was talking about, is that pull exchanges can't resolve unknown unknowns, right? If, if you don't know what you don't know, you're never going to search for that knowledge. And so push exchanges might have the potential, in a way, almost because of the inaccurate recognition of what people need, right? So I think you need knowledge. You don't think you need knowledge, but I come to you and offer it to you, and maybe you're like, oh, I did need that knowledge. Um, and so, they're, they're so, they're so they each have a role, I think. They're both important. And I think the organizations have to think more about them collectively as a system. They have to think, you know, how do we facilitate all the knowledge flows and, and open up the channels so that, you know, we have the most efficient and most effective uh, most innovative sort of format for this. Okay, yeah, and if, I the knowledge, if the knowledge is stored in the network of people rather than a hard ar archive, isn't there a chance of distortion of the data via memory prejudice? <laughs> that's, a, that's a very philosophical question. Um, I'll go back to something I said at the, at the, at the member summit is, um, uh, Polanyi, who's the kind of father of tacit knowledge, said that if you remove the human element of knowledge, you actually destroy knowledge. And, and so there's this interesting perspective of whether or not knowledge is subjective or objective. Um, absolutely, knowledge evolves as it goes through people, no doubt about it. Um, that may or may not be good. And in some contexts, probably you're right, that the, or whoever asked the question, that memory bias, that sort of uh, that shifting of evolving form may not be as good as, an, as, as another form, a previous form of that same, you know, nugget of knowledge, right? Um, so I don't think I'm, and, and in this case, even though I'm talking about knowledge exchanges per se amongst people, I'm not sort of saying that repositories don't have some kind of value, because they, they absolutely do. Um, but I think it's also important to realize that they're not the end-all be-all of, of, of knowledge retention slash, you know, diffusion. Yeah, one, um, this is Martha Malone. One thing that I thought that if people didn't see the, um, the webinar that um, Rob did last year with ConocoPhillips folks showing their tool that they used and how they used experts and saved data on their networking tool, I think that's a really good one. Um, the video of that is still available on the brown bag um, page. I think it's February 2011. That might be something of use to look at if you're looking for what others might have done. Yeah, and ConocoPhillips was actually the most admired knowledge enterprise in 2011 or something. So they're, they have some really advanced systems. Some best practices definitely exist there in their walls. OK, we have a couple minutes left if anyone has any other questions. You guys made me so conscious of watching the drop off that I'm glad we only had like you know four, four or five people drop off in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> Boop.
Well, if there are no other questions, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. And just a reminder that the Research on Research Winter Meeting is in February, February 25th through the 27th in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. So um, please check with us on the uh, winter meeting pages to see who, what groups are meeting there. And we, we hope you join us and participate. Thank you, Rob. Thanks, Natalie right. and Len, too, for joining us. Thank you very much. And for taking yep. your time to do this. Thank you. Okay. Thank sure. you. Bye.